Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What, what a blessing it is that we are able to gather together on this Easter Sunday morning to praise God, to witness to our faith, to celebrate God's great and glorious victory over death. Now, if you're sitting in the sanctuary this morning, I'd be asking you for an amen right about now, but, but I'll let you say it at your computer screens or at your phone screens, however you're watching this today. Can I get an amen? What a joy it is that we come together to celebrate one of the keystone moments of our faith. And I hope this Sunday morning that, that you are staying safe, that you are staying well, and that you are growing in your relationship to God as once again, we will go to the tomb only to find it empty. Now, now I do have a, a couple of announcements for you this morning. I, I hope that you have had the opportunity to watch Betsy Beatty's Sunday School lesson. If you haven't, it is on our Facebook page. You can find the link to it there. I, I want to thank Betsy for continuing to reach out to share with us that important time of Sunday school. Uh, this upcoming Wednesday, Beth's UMK lesson will be posted on the church Facebook, and I hope that you can take some time out of your day just to watch that and, and to grow in your faith as we celebrate that. Uh, our hot dogs will be again this upcoming Thursday. They're going to be delivery only. So if you are hungry, if you know of someone who's hungry, please get them to call our church. We'll take orders. We drop the hot dogs right off on your porch. Uh, so that will be this Thursday from four to six. And I want to thank everyone who continues to contribute to that, who continues to reach out to feed the hungry, to fulfill that great call of discipleship. And I also want to thank everyone who placed a flower on our cross this morning. Isn't it amazing how, how this instrument of torture can be transformed through, through the gift of flowers? And, and it is just beautiful to behold it. I know if you came and put some flowers on there, you realize just how beautiful that cross is. And, and I want to thank everyone who was a part of that. Also, this Wednesday, we are going to be continuing our, our Zoom Bible study. We're going to be starting in a new book uh, this Wednesday. We're going to be starting in the book of Nahum. Uh, so if you are curious about what the book of Nahum has to teach us about faith, please join us in our Zoom Bible study. And, and most of all, I just want to thank you for being here this glorious Easter Sunday as we witness to our faith as we grow through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, connecting us, even though we're disconnected on this day. Now, I invite you to, to join me in a time of prayer. We'll, we'll begin with a silent prayer, then we'll have a spoken prayer, then we'll all come together for the Lord's Prayer. Brothers and sisters, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, you who raised Jesus Christ from the dead and through your grace wrapped our lives in his, we give you thanks for the gift of this new day. We give you thanks for your grace and your love, which you have poured out upon your creation and which you have used to draw us into this time of holy worship. We pray that you will use this time of worship to shape and to form us more into the kind of disciples you have called us to be. Lord, as we gather together at the tomb once more, we praise you for the ways that you continue to call us into new lives of resurrection. In Jesus' victory over death, you showed us that there is no valley too deep or chasm too wide that your love cannot reach. We praise you that from a tomb you can bring forth new life, and from us gathered here today, you still bring new life from us and for us. And we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and enable us to live as children of the resurrection 
here and now. Father, as we survey your world, we see just how far we have fallen from how you created us to be. You have called us to be a people of light, a people of life, and yet we see the darkness and death here in our world today. We see it in a virus that steals away people's lives. We see it in a virus that, that closes down our communities. God, we pray for your help today. We pray that you would use us to shine your light into this world. We pray that we would be freed for joyful obedience to your holy way. Lord, we pray for all those who are lost on this morning. We pray that the glow of your resurrection might lead them back to you. Almighty God, we pray for all those who, who have no one else to pray for them on this day. We, we pray that they would hear their names called in your great and in your glorious love. And Father, you know those concerns that, that we hold on our hearts. Here this morning, we lift before you Billy and Mike, Janet and Deborah, Vera and Jim, Ruth and Sherry, John and Bertha, Ara Ann and Larry, Sue and Ed, Nancy and Carleen, Joe and Gary, Earlene and Babs, E.L. and Marty, Betty and Hudson, Lisa and Brandon, Teresa and Chris, Jeff and Beverly, Kim and Rita, Lauren and Rick, Martha and the Best Family, Ethan and Aaron, Jessica and Cody, and all those names and situations that we hold on our hearts, Lord, we lift them into your holy hands. We pray for the leaders of Cherryville, the leaders of Gaston County, the state of North Carolina, the United States and the world. We pray that they will look to you for wisdom and guidance and discernment. We pray that they will follow your way of the cross. We pray for all those who love and serve their communities, and we pray that they may be empowered as they seek to love their neighbors. We pray for our soldiers, for their safe return, and for an end to war. And now as children of God and children of the resurrection, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray by praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our gospel lesson today, it, it comes to us from the gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And I invite you to hear once again today the Easter story. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple, they went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but, but did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For yet they did not understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. 
And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, and one of them at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they've laid him. And when she said this, she turned around. She saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me because I've not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene went and she announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She told them those things that he had said to her. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Will y'all pray with me? Almighty God, you who continue to surprise and astound us, Lord, we pray that you would pour out your good news into our lips and onto our hearts in order that we might proclaim your holy ways. For it is in your holy name and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. You know, when you have young kids in the house, there, there are certain phrases that become commonplace, things that you wouldn't say any other time. Things like, get that out of your mouth. How did you end up in there? What in the world made you think this was going to be a good idea? And I'm convinced every family, they've, they've got their own favorite version of these phrases, things that they say the most commonly. In the Christie household, I'll tell you what ours is. The most common phrase you'll hear Crystal and I say regarding our kids is, hey, come in here, you've got to see this. You won't believe what your child is doing. Come in here and look at this. Any given day, you come through the Christie household, I promise you, you'll hear that two or three times. It's, it's gotten so bad that Eli will sometimes come and find Crystal and I and say, you've got to look at what your sister is doing, because Ella has a way of finding herself locked in a closet or, or trying to swim in the dog bowl, you know, those kinds of things. And, and you can't really explain them. You've got to see them. A couple weeks back, Crystal and I, we were cleaning out the house. And, and I know what you're thinking. With, with two kids under five, it seems like a fool's errand to even try and clean a house. But, but you know, at a certain point, you got to do the vacuum and you got to fold the clothes. You got to pick up the toys. You got to clean off the countertops, those sorts of things. And, and we were doing that. Crystal was, was folding clothes. Eli was picking up toys. I had Ella in the bathroom with me because Ella tends to be a bit of a tornado of destruction. Can't really leave her alone. So, so she was back there helping me clean off the countertops. And I moved everything off of my sink countertop, my, my razor, my contacts, my, my toothbrush, all those sorts of things, and put them over to the side. And I was spraying it down and washing it off. And and I heard Ella kind of rustling around over to the side. And all of a sudden, she started saying, ooh, daddy, so pretty. Ooh, daddy, so cute. And I thought she was complimenting my cleaning. And I thought, you know what? I am a pretty good cleaner. And I just kept scrubbing away. I, I washed the mirror and all that. And she kept saying, ooh, so pretty. Ooh, so cute. And I thought, I'm doing such a good job. And then I looked over and I saw my two-year-old daughter standing in a bathtub with my razor trying to shave her face going, ooh, so cute, ooh, so pretty, so beautiful, daddy. 
And I looked at her and she'd, she'd nicked herself in a couple places. She, she had those little blood spots forming on her cheeks and she looked so proud of herself. And, and I started hollering for Crystal and I said, Crystal, you got to come in here and see this. And she said, that, can't you just tell me what it is? I'm trying to fold clothes. And I said, I wish I could explain this to you. You got to come and see this. And, and so she ran into the bathroom and there was Ella and she looked up at her smiling so big. She still had that razor in her hand. She said, ooh, mama, look at me. I'm beautiful. But you had to see it. You, you can understand that. It wouldn't make sense if I just said to Crystal, your your daughter got a razor and she tried to shave her face. No, you have to see it. I'm convinced that's why we have phones with, with cameras on them. Because when you find yourself in hard to believe situations, what's the very first thing you do? You, you snap a picture of them. You want people to see it. If you put something on social media, you want it to be something worth seeing. News anchors, they, they've really figured this out. You, you may have noticed whenever you're watching the news, right before a commercial break, the anchor will say, stick around with us. You've got to see this to believe it. Now, who in their right mind is going to turn off the TV after an invitation like this? You got to see it. It seems for a long time that the very best way to engage us as people is to get us to come and to see. And if ever there was a master at getting people to go to their friends, go to their families, go to their communities, to come and see brothers and sisters, it was Jesus Christ. Jesus called so many people to run back to where they came from to get others to come and see. It started with Philip and Nathaniel. Right at the very beginning of his ministry, Philip goes to find his friend Nathaniel, and he says, you've got to come and see this man. I think he might be the Messiah. His name is Jesus from Nazareth. And, and Nathaniel says to Philip, wait, did you say he's from Nazareth? Can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip says, you just got to come and see. And Nathaniel does. He goes, he sees, he believes, he becomes a member of the twelve. That, that's what happened with the Samaritan woman at the well, right? A after Jesus spoke with her for a little bit, she dropped her water jug at the well. She ran back to her community in Samaria, and she said, you've got to come and see this man who has told me everything I have ever done. He can't be the Messiah, can he? Come on, let's go see him. And she brings the entire town back to the well to come and see Jesus. And they believe. Oh, it's true of, of Mary and Martha as well. When, when their brother Lazarus dies, they bring Jesus to the tomb and they say, Lord, come and see. He is dead. In fact, the King James even says, he stinketh. And Jesus says, he's not dead. He's only sleeping. Lazarus, get up and walk. And Lazarus walks out of that tomb. And Mary and Martha, they see. They believe. Seeing is believing. And yet perhaps there's never been a more improbable invitation to come and see anything in the world than the one that Mary Magdalene gives Peter and John on this morning. She runs into their house and she says, come and see. They have taken the Lord away. He's not in his tomb. And that pull to come and see, it's too strong for the disciples to ignore. You see, at this point, they're in hiding. And why they're in hiding has, has a little bit of something to do with, with how the last couple of days in Jerusalem have gone. It started that Thursday night when, when Jesus took his disciples to an upper room. He, he washed their feet and then he broke bread with them saying, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. He shared wine with them saying, take, drink, this is my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he gave that piece of bread to Judas and Judas ran out the door to go and betray Jesus. He ran to the authority, sold him out for 30 pieces of silver and then found Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane, betraying him with a kiss. 
Now, those disciples, some of them, they, they tried to stay and fight, but eventually they too ran. Even Peter, who made that proud proclamation, Lord, even if I must die with you, I will not abandon you. Peter, Peter runs away as well. That Thursday night, Jesus is taken to, to a trial. If you can really call it a trial, it's not much of a trial. It's more like kangaroo court. The, the judge and the jury and the executioner had all determined Jesus' guilt before he ever stepped foot in there. They pay a bunch of false witnesses to come in and, and, and try to lie about things that Jesus has said, but their stories don't agree. And finally, it, it takes this dramatic moment where Caiaphas, the high priest, he rips open his shirt and he says, what more evidence do we need? This man is guilty of blasphemy. He must be murdered, killed, executed. And they take Jesus to Pilate. Now, Pilate, Pilate doesn't know what to do with Jesus. He hasn't broken any of the Roman laws. He hasn't done anything that, that Pilate can find to be untoward or anything like that. He even asked Jesus, what, what am I supposed to do with you? Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, you say so. And Pilate is amazed at Jesus' silence. So that good Friday morning, Pilate takes Jesus out in front of the crowd, this crowd that it had just five days beforehand shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, here comes our Messiah. That same crowd, Pilate says, what do you want me to do with this Jesus? And they shout, crucify him. And so then Pilate tries to give the crowd another out. And he says, you know, it's tradition. We'll release to you one prisoner. Now, now, who do you want? Do you want Jesus or do you want Barabbas, a convicted murderer? And the crowd shouts, we want Barabbas. And he says, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And the crowd shouts, crucify him. Well, Jesus is made to carry a wooden cross, probably weighing upwards of 200 pounds through the streets of Jerusalem as people spit at him, as people jeer him. He goes to Golgotha, the place of the skull, and it is there from on top of that cross that Jesus breathes his last breath near sundown on Friday evening. And after Jesus dies, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, that man who went to visit Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry, they, they take Jesus's body down. They try their best to prepare it for burial. They stick him in the closest tomb they can find, and then they have to get back home because Sabbath starts at sundown on Friday evening. That Saturday, they spend the entire day in Sabbath, and that Sunday morning, a Sunday morning much like this one, Mary Magdalene goes at daybreak out to the tomb to go and find the body of Jesus, to go and prepare it for burial, to give Jesus the dignity that he deserves while the disciples stay in hiding. But when Mary Magdalene gets to the graveyard, she sees that the stone has been rolled back. And that tomb is empty. And so she runs to Peter. She runs to John. And she says, they have taken him away. Come and see the tomb is empty. And that pull to come and see, it's just a bit too strong for Peter and John. They, they throw their safety to the wind. They, they leave their everything behind just so that they can go and see that the tomb is indeed empty. And they run. John beats Peter to the tomb. And he kneels outside the tomb. And he, he tries his best to look in, but, but he can't quite see anything. Peter, he runs on in. And he looks around that tomb. Everything's where it should be. There are linens. There's the cloth that Jesus' head was wrapped in. But, but there's no body. No body. John comes in. He looks around. There's no body. And, and in the Gospel of John, John tells us that, that he and Peter, they saw and they believed. But what they believed, it's, it's not immediately apparent. Because immediately after John tells us that they came and they saw and and they believe, he tells us, that they did not yet understand that Jesus must be raised from the dead. And Peter and John, content with having come and having seen, they, they go back to hiding, go back to the upper room. But, but Mary, Mary, she refuses to leave. She's not going to give up with Jesus' body being taken. She is going to hunt that body down. She is going to do everything she possibly can 
to pay her respects to Jesus in a manner befitting the man that Jesus Christ was. And she stands outside that tomb weeping. She weeps out of fear that she might not ever be able to find the body again. She weeps out of anger that someone would have taken that body. She weeps out of helplessness. But then she looks back in to the tomb. And where that tomb was empty beforehand, she sees two angels sitting in white. And they ask her, why are you weeping? And she says, they've taken my Lord away. I just want to find him. And then she sees a man standing off to her side. And she thinks he's just the gardener. And the man asks her, why are you weeping, woman? And she says, they've taken my Lord away. Sir, if you have moved the body, just tell me where it is. I will come. I will carry it by myself. You don't have to do anything. And throughout history, people, people have wondered how Mary couldn't notice Jesus standing right there beside her. Some people suggest that, that she was crying too hard, she couldn't see clearly or something like that. But, but I'll tell you why I don't think Mary could, could see Jesus in that moment. The reason is Mary's looking for a corpse. And, and this gardener that she sees, he's, he's very much alive. See, seeing may be believing, but, but sometimes even what we see, we can't actually believe. It's only when Jesus says her name, Mary, that she feels that fire inside of her. She feels her heart jumping and skipping a beat, and she realizes that this gardener is no gardener. This gardener is Jesus. He is raised. He is alive. And she says, Rabboni, teach her. She goes and she gives him a big hug and Jesus says, don't hold on to me. I haven't yet ascended. Why don't you go and tell my disciples what you've seen? Jesus gives Mary the charge to go. And so she does. The, the very first one to proclaim the resurrection, the very first one to proclaim the gospel, it is Mary Magdalene. And she runs to that upper room and she says, I have seen the Lord. He is alive, and he's told me to come and tell you to, to go, that you too need to go and see him. So we're told the disciples meet Mary's request with, with quite a bit of skepticism. Seems they, they can't quite bring themselves to believe just, just yet, just yet. It won't be until later that day that they too will see that they too will believe. And that's where John leaves us on, on the Easter story. It's an amazing story about coming and seeing, about coming to hear the good news, about coming to a tomb expecting to find a corpse and instead finding the resurrected Lord. It's amazing. And yet you might find yourself on this Easter Sunday wondering where there's good news in that story for you. All across the world, our churches are empty on this Easter Sunday that's, that's never happened before. We have this virus. We don't know when it's going to end. You may find yourself wondering where there is hope, where there is good news in this Easter for us to carry with us out into the world. I tell you, for, for me, the best news about Easter, it's not just that that tomb is empty. It's not just that Jesus Christ is raised. No, the best news of Easter is that Jesus Christ has given us as disciples a job to do. That Jesus has given us a calling to come and to see him. I find it absolutely remarkable that when Jesus is raised from the dead, he doesn't just go back up to Pilate and say, you want to try again, big boy. That, that Jesus doesn't just run back to Caiaphas. And the high priest doesn't go before the Sanhedrin and say, you guys want to try this again? You've already tried once. You can't stop me. I'm better than you. But, but that's not what Jesus does. No, Jesus Christ gives his disciples a charge to come and to see him. And I know, I know there are some people who will tell you, you, you can't see Jesus anymore. He said it himself in, in the Gospel of John. He said, I've not yet ascended to my father. We're going to celebrate Ascension Sunday. It's 50 days after Easter. And that's what the season of Pentecost is all about. How we as disciples continue to live faithfully without 
Jesus being physically present with us. But well, I'm going to tell you what, if somebody tells you you can't see Jesus today, they're looking in all the wrong places. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells us exactly what we need to do if we want to come and see him. Judgment of Nations passage there. Jesus says that, that the king will set two groups of people on his right and on his left. And he will ask both of them the same questions. Where were you when I was tired? Where were you when I was hungry, thirsty, sick, naked, or imprisoned, homeless, or a stranger? For just as you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. Brothers and sisters, we, we are able to see Jesus everywhere we look, if we're looking in the right places, if we are following his calling to go and to serve the least of these, if we are willing to serve one another, I promise you, we will see Jesus. And as disciples, that is one of the great callings that Jesus Christ has given us. He doesn't leave us to our own devices. He doesn't say, I'm resurrected, my work is done. No, Jesus Christ breaks out of the tomb and gives us a calling to come and to find him, to go and to see him. And as those who have been called to be disciples by our baptisms, we too have been called to go and to find Jesus, to go and to see Jesus. So, so in the light of this Easter, in the glow of this resurrection, good news, I want us to make a conscious decision today. I want us to wake up every morning earnestly seeking to see Jesus. Wherever it is that we are sent in our days, I want us to go looking to find Jesus. Because you know what happens. You wake up like that a few days. You, you might just want to invite someone else to come and to see Jesus with you. And brothers and sisters, as long as we do that, Easter will never end. As long as we continue to invite people to come and see Jesus, the good news of God, the gospel, the resurrection will never stop being proclaimed. And I don't know about y'all, but I sincerely think our world needs to see Jesus as badly now as it ever has before. May we be the kind of people who invite others to come and to see. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Will y'all join me in prayer? Almighty God, we give you so much thanks and praise that, that not only have you raised your Son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, but Lord, that you have invited us to come and see him as well, that you have invited us to share in that resurrection life. Lord God, we, we pray that as we leave this place today, that we would feel your hands around us, that we would feel your Holy Spirit leading us. For it is in your holy name, and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, we do have some offering here that, that we're going to bless today. We, we want to thank everyone who is continuing to contribute to the church, to the mission and the ministry, and certainly to, to making sure that our community gets the resources that it needs. So if you will, please join me as we ask God to bless this offering. Heavenly Father, we return to you a small portion of what you have so richly blessed us with. Lord God, we pray that you would take these gifts of our tithes and our offerings and that you would use them how you see fit, that they might be used to the benefit of your kingdom and to the glory of your holy name here in Cherryville and wherever else it is that you send us. For it is in your name and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we are once again going to carry the light of Christ out 
of the sanctuary and into the world as a reminder that each and every one of us has been called to bear this light, to share this light, and to remind ourselves that there is no darkness that can stop the movement of God's light in this world. If you will, please receive this benediction. Go forth this week with the good news of resurrection on your lips and with the hope of God's love burning in your heart in order that you might invite others to come and to see Jesus with you. For it is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit we are sent. Amen. I hope that you have a blessed Easter. I thank you so much for joining us here at First United Methodist Charitable for this Easter service. And I look forward to seeing you soon. May you have a blessed day.